So Jesse Morton is the CEO and founder of Parallel Networks, a nonprofit dedicated to combating hate and extremism. And he was once a prominent radicalizer in the West, helping to insert the narrative of Al Qaeda into the American ambit. Today, he works to transform ideologies of violence into ones of peace using trauma-informed approaches to help people coming out of radicalization. Thank you so much, Jesse, for being with us. Very good. And thank you guys for enduring what is maybe going to become a pretty painful conversation, but hopefully we'll skate through. Um, I think I'll just frame the beginning, and I think tonight should be a very collaborative and cooperative um, discussion. So I just want to go through a personal arc and a trajectory from which we might be able to identify milestone markers that can inform uh, how we can go about addressing the continuous metastasization and issue that radicalization into violent extremism uh, has to play on our society. And I would argue that as a result of 20 years in the war on terror, we are now facing two fundamental problems, that we are recognizing that the war of attrition that Osama bin Laden stated that he was going to wage against us in the United States is coming to fruition and that we are losing a lot of our ability to exert influence around the world. And that we're also, as a result of wasting billions of dollars abroad to drop bombs and to um, engage in military uh, victories futilely, uh, if we see what just happened in Afghanistan in particular, that we have depleted the trust of our own citizenry in the institutions that make democracies um, sustenance and maintenance possible. So we used to belong to tribes. We come from a tribalist uh, outlook. It, we're almost hardwired to believe in a form of tribalism. And if you're going to introduce multicultural democracy, we have to trust the institutions because the institutions have replaced the tribal leaders with regard to how we hold the fabric of our society together. And so I think that part of what we want to take away today is how we all might play a role in doing what we can do in exerting influence where we have the ability to exert influence in a manner that can sort of reverse some of those processes that have come to define us. And now, as we turn to wage a war on domestic extremism, I would also argue that we're replicating a lot of the same mistakes we made at the beginning of the war on terror, setting for the very black and white worldview where we were told you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. We were not given an opportunity to understand any grievances of the extremists that may have been very valid. Uh, we were not uh, given an ability to understand Islam as distinct from um, violent extremist Islam. And there's a lot of uh, fundamental uh, sort of uh, cognitive biases that come into play with how we as a society are addressing this issue. And underneath all of extremism lies polarization. And we are now at unprecedented levels of toxic polarization and as a consequence, toxic disinformation. So the ideas that we are engaging with while we consider those inside of our echo chamber to be neutral and to be valid and to be accurate in actuality are oftentimes painted by fundamental misunderstanding of a nuanced reality. Very, we're constantly in conversations with echo chambers that are completely full of bias and inaccuracies. And the only way to get out of that, as my organization now espouses, is you can't address any problem at the same order of consciousness that creates it. The only way out of this is if we can mobilize together and utilize what we're learning in the sciences and what we're learning about consciousness and trauma to realize that 20 years into the war on terror, we're basically all suffering from a case of PTSD, that we're all effectively tra uh, traumatized and that we're all increasingly radicalizing. And a lot of us that are radicalizing aren't necessarily aware of it because when we dehumanize the other and sort of try to rule out their ability to exist, we actually aid and facilitate their ultimate objectives. And I could start my story by saying in many ways, I should have been an all-American boy. My name is Jesse Morton, born that way. My father's from Jersey. He was an affluent son of a prominent attorney. My lineage on my father's side goes all the way back to the Mayflower, sons and daughters of the American Revolution. I'm a direct descendant of John Adams. Uh, a family member was a co-signer of the Declaration of Independence. But my father during the 1960s had his own sort of cognitive opening or uh, open susceptibility to radicalization during that period of time when his father, but it was induced by his father dying out of nowhere from lung cancer at the age of 40. And it induced this sort of crisis in my father's mind where he was set to become an attorney like his father, but instead he moved to a very small town to engage in a liberal arts education in Pennsylvania where he met my mother, working class woman, very closed society, not a lot of contact with the world, coming from working class background, they conceived me and married. 
Um, he decided rather than to continue his education that he would move us to a middle of a farm, 200 year old farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania, where we would be raised in this utopia in line with his beatnik sort of counterculturalist leftist leanings. We did, we had good two years, according to my mother, organic fruit, marijuana in the woodshed, his Jersey friends would come purchase the marijuana. We were able to survive that way. And he lived that hippie quality of life, but started to um, cheat on my mother, started to spend increasingly uh, limited amount of time in the house. And it exacerbated probably uh, pre-existent conditions of mental illness that my mother had, probably bipolar disorder with rage and violence, uh, in control of her urges and an inability to regulate her emotions and her anxiety. And she started to beat us. Uh, very, my earliest memory is basically my mother laying on top of me in an old farmhouse, choking me, my sister screaming, saying, mom, mom, stop, you're gonna kill him, uh, and begging her to stop. And uh, that being uh, basically the earliest memory that I have, I don't remember what age it was, but certainly caused a lot of fr friction inside of my own uh, mental well-being. So anyway, we were being that we were in the middle of nowhere, there was nobody, bystanders could not intervene because nobody could hear the cries, they couldn't hear the screams. I ended up adopting this position where I had to protect my sister, I had to protect my siblings, I was willing to sacrifice myself. I became a labeled black sheep misfit that allowed me to sort of adopt the self-fulfilling prophecy, became a sort of a bad kid in school as I gravitated into my teenage years, started peddling marijuana, started smoking marijuana, started not going to class, um, sabotaged a lot of the natural uh, talent and, and, and gifts that, that I had and, and, and pushed them in a negative direction. Really suffered from the trauma in the house and ran away at 15, took to the streets and emulated my father in the sense that I absorbed all kinds of far leftist ideology, anarchism, communism, um, but also became a deadhead. So I decided that I hated American society that was so materialist um, and that I didn't want to be a part of it. So I traveled around with the Grateful Dead. I became a, a hippie of sorts, sold drugs on concert parking lots, never, ever had to exist in like real American society, lived completely off the charts. Um, and tried to cope with my trauma, but of course I couldn't. So I became falling increasingly into narcotics use, increasingly into addiction, increasingly into incarceration. And the first time that I was incarcerated when I was 19 years old, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And there was a figurehead that I could relate with. Somebody who suffered from persecution and oppression was unrecognized. Someone who um, was able to engage in a very criminal lifestyle, but went to jail, transformed his life, adopted a radical ideology, became a social justice warrior. So it opened up a search and a quest for religion and spirituality, but I like to define it now as if I was seeking for a religion of Malcolm X in Islam, not so much the religion of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Um, and so really was looking for an outlet to project political and personal grievances onto. Uh, a couple of years later, having fallen further into addiction, I was incarcerated in Richmond City Jail, uh, which is in, Al is in Virginia. And the first thing that I met when I walked onto an open man, 40 man cell block was a veteran of the Afghan Soviet Jihad, someone who had fought abroad as Al Qaeda and as the Afghan uh, Mujahideen had depleted and waged the war of attrition against uh, the Soviets. And this was before 9-11. But basically, I was taught a beautiful way of life that radically transformed my ability to control myself. I was given five times prayer a day. I was given the beautiful piece of Ramadan fasting and controlling my urges 30 30 days, you know, one month out of the year. Um, I was given the ability of charity and zakat and the five pillars of Islam. But at one point, once I solidified those understandings, he basically gave me a new identity. He told me to wash every inch of my body and that when he, I came out, I would take my actual declaration of faith. Everything that I had done up until life before then was completely written out of God's eyes. And he gave me a new name, Yunus Abdullah Muhammad. Yunus is in English, Jonah, the prophet in the Bible that swallowed by the whale and spit back out. He told me that I was in the belly of the beast and that I always ignored God's command, but that my order, marching orders, was to go to the American people and explain to them the truth of Islam, that this was what made Jonah powerful as a preacher because he had ignored God's commands and had experienced trauma and had experienced tribulation. So it made him stronger in the way that he preached. And Abdullah, meaning I was a slave of Allah and Muhammad, that Muhammad was the one I had to follow. And at one point he got in a fight, I won't get into the details, in the jail, but I had never had a contact with sort of a justification for fighting and violence that was framed around religious terms. And he told me about an impending war between the evils of the West, because the Taliban had established Sharia law in Afghanistan and the West would never allow it to happen. 
And he told me that eventually I would see that there would be an onset of a war that would represent the beginning of an Armageddon-like situation. So tapped into prophecy and analysis of politics that when I left and started to dramatic, I completely became a non-hippie. Prayed five times a day, stopped drinking alcohol, stopped smoking, it just completely changed everything. And um, was living in the Salvation Army in Syracuse, New York, when 9-11 happened. So by the time George Bush said, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists, I thought then I was making a rational decision to reject my own society. I realize now that because society had not protected me or recognized me, I couldn't relate with them. So it was a personal frustration projected onto my own community. And it allowed me, in given a black and white perspective, it actually pushed me down the rabbit hole that was radicalization. So anyway, long story short, I became a very prominent preacher in, Har in Harlem, New York met an organization that was affiliated with the largest radicalization and recruitment agency in the West called Al Mahajirun that operated out of London, climbed the ranks. They loved to have a white boy, you know, who had blue eyes, who adopted the ideology, who could speak the language of the American, uh, became a very prominent preacher, eventually got frustrated and continued to radicalize and started my own organization called Revolution Muslim. Revolution Muslim was connected to 15 different terrorist plots. And basically what I did was I used the American um, art of communications and media to convey the message of Al-Qaeda in a way that the West could understand it. So you could think of it as Al-Qaeda on uh, Madison Avenue or Al-Qaeda in Hollywood. I used social media for the first time, created English language jotty magazines, glossy images. We created high quality video production. Um, we created an ecosystem or an entire chamber whereby we could tap into the emotions and vulnerabilities of people online connect them to a core website where they would immediately be able to get all of their information in a 24 seven news cycle. We had a radio station, we had live discussions and immediately when we would connect with them, we would give them a role to play in our organizations. They had belonging. And we were very effective in doing this. It became a very transnational English language jihadist outfit. Like I said, it was connected to 15 different terrorist plots, but radicalized thousands and thousands. And, um, my fundamental mistake was when we threatened the writers of South Park for portraying the Prophet Muhammad in caricature, um, tried to create controversy around that, and I broke the law. I knew I was going to be arrested, so I left for Morocco, and I ran to Morocco where I lived for about a year. And during my time in Morocco, I removed myself from the network. That's why I call my organization Parallel Networks now, because I realized that I would have never de-radicalized or changed my views had I not stepped outside of my echo chamber. And so instead of thinking about individual ideas and why we adopt them, we try to build networks that can provide avenues out and we try to build networks that can create the same processes that radicals create, offering meaning, significance, purpose, and community camaraderie um, to extremists, but to do so from a pro-social pro sort of direction that gets outside the box of hyperpolarization. So regardless, I, I, I removed myself and then I was teaching Moroccan Arab millennial youth um, to prep them for GRE, GMAT studies. Um, and the Arab Spring broke out. When the Arab Spring broke out, there was widespread attention to the Middle East as this like, it was just an incredible time of hope. One of uh, the misunderstandings of the war on terror is that uh, Osama bin Laden is not, was not waging 9-11 against us because he hated democracy and human rights. He was articulating his strategy as a means of depleting a far enemy that could prop up authoritarian dictatorships in the Arab world that he called um, the far enemy, uh, so that basically the jihadists and the Islamists could take on the regimes that they felt we were responsible for implementing. So it was a grievance against foreign policy. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> in the context of the Arab Spring, it became readily apparent that, um, that, that, that violence that we were espousing uh, as the means of change was not what spurred the Arab Spring. It also became readily apparent that most of the Arab millennial youth that I had contact with really didn't want anything to do with the pristine utopic past that I was selling, and that they were at the same time very good human beings. So it was our conversations that really started to cast a doubt on my belief that violence could ever achieve anything, right? And then a combination of that, when Osama bin Laden released some propaganda during my time there, I was able to better understand the inconsistencies and the illogical nature and the, and the logical fallacies within it because I was extracted from that group that if you ever say, I disagree, you can't when you're caught in the echo chamber. Um, from there, I was uh, eventually picked up, despite the fact that I had started to change, I was eventually picked up by the United States government two weeks after they killed Osama bin Laden in, uh, in, in, in Abbottabad, Pakistan. They arrested me, spent um, 
five months in a Moroccan jail where I met a former extremist preacher that I had translated his lectures. He had changed his views. That was my first contact with an extreme, a former extremist. And I thought, wow, if I hadn't thrown my entire life away, I probably could have walked this route, but I was facing life in prison. The US came, took me back to the United States, housed me in solitary confinement like they're willing to do, um, 23 hours a day in a cell, I spent over a year of my life in that condition. But a very kind guard came in and would take me to the law library, which housed the general jailhouse library, uh, four days a week for her 10 hour shifts. And I'd sit there and I reconnected to the Encyclopedia Britannica's great books of the Western world, read the Federalist Papers. I was in Alexandria, Virginia. So there was all kinds of biographies of the founding fathers of the United States, all kinds of philosophical works, um, a lot of really good, solid liberal, um, liberal readings. And that had a big, profound impact because when I would go back to the cell for the rest of my solitary confinement, I would read the texts of Islam. And for the first time, I was able to interpret them with my own heart. I didn't need to sit and memorize information from a Salafi jihadist extremist preacher and was told critical thinking, conscious thinking and interpretation was bid'ah or innovation in Islam, that, it, that, that, that I reconnected to an ability to understand God in my own way. And reading the Quran and the Hadith for the first time became a fundamentally new um, situation and circumstance for me. I pled guilty to the charges that were thrown against me, which cap capped me at 15 years. And a lot of my students ended up traveling because in this interim period, the Arab Spring went kind of bad and Syria turned into a jihad and then it birthed ISIS. So as ISIS was mobilizing, we started to notice that many of my students were abroad. I started to collaborate with the US government on how they could go about better countering violent extremism. They found me uh, to have some good information. Um, we were able to collect data and intelligence on my students that were plotting things from abroad and able to thwart some attacks. And, after originally being sentenced to 11 and a half years incarceration, I was released on March 1st, 2015, due to my um, work with the US government. So out of nowhere, a judge ordered my release. The US government had no program for my reintegration, rehabilitation. I couldn't go to a halfway house. No halfway house would take me. And I was thrown back into society and didn't really know much what to do. Worked uh, as a construction worker and all these uh, sort of odd jobs. And I also worked with the FBI as an analyst and an informant. They sent me back into the fields. Um, and I was able to do very productive work to the point where we um, thwarted a beheading in Virginia. Um, but the case went to court and the defense attorney outed me as the person who had worked the case and as somebody who had a convicted terrorism offense in the Washington Post. So I could no longer do my governmental work. So I decided to become America's first public former jihadist. And I went public, uh, found the job. Uh, I also, interestingly enough, like I got a master's degree from all jihadists, uh, you know, all extremists are not in any way, shape or form like stupid, right? I got a master's degree from Columbia and ran an outpatient substance abuse clinic for 10 years of my life uh, in Brooklyn, New York while I was active. So um, just to, you know, just to put that out there, I leveraged that, got a job at George Washington University's program on extremism, went public, told my story. And for the first time, told a New York Times reporter, that I had been abused as a child. And in doing that, set forth a process of re-traumatization that really led me to collapse. I relapsed on drugs for the first time in 14 years um, and threw away the opportunity of a lifetime, but learned from that, that the ideology that I adopted was my addiction. Islam never really allowed me to heal my trauma. I just substituted heroin and cocaine for jihadism and it kept me clean and sober, but I wasn't in recovery. So now, having learned all those experiences in 2017, I started an organization that combats toxic polarization, toxic misinformation, hate and extremism and their intersections, and decided to take from my experience as a jihadist, in conjunction with my co-founder, the former director of intelligence at the NYPD that monitored me for five years, we decided that we could go about addressing these issues from a very different holistic way. And I now run an organization called Parallel Networks that's largely informed by network theory, largely informed by what we call trauma encountering violent extremism informed care. We've really pioneered a lot of work in this arena to change the way that we approach the phenomenon of radicalization and violent extremism. Uh, and um, our, it's a combination of learning from our experiences and continuously building out our networks and continuously to look at the work that we're doing as laying the groundwork to formulate a network that can create uh, a parallel network that does not attack the problem at the same order of consciousness that creates it that looks at what we're learning about phenomenon mm -hmm. such as trauma, phenomenon such as um, decision-making under conditions of uncertainty, and all of the scientific breakthroughs that we're discovering, which are quite compatible with the identification that in order to have successful 
belonging, meaning, and significance. We have to have spirituality. We might distinguish between religion and spirituality, but a spiritual ethos is crucial alongside of a trust in institutions for the sustainment of democracy, even if it means that that spirituality is built on the fundamental belief that we all share in common values, but may differ in belief systems. So I'm going to end there, basically, and hopefully that establishes enough milestone markers that we can talk about what some of the work we're doing now um, achieves. And with Ryan, Ryan is a, a perfect example of an individual who has a very similar trajectory, comes from the far right, as opposed to jihadism, works with my organization now, and we're continuing to expand our relations with him and benefit from his knowledge. And I'm going to shut this video off and get on this train, and I'll be back with you when Ryan's done sharing. Thank you so much for your time, and I apologize for it any of the complications. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, that was really amazing. And I'm sure we all have things that we maybe wanna ask um, later during Q&A. So feel free to put any questions that come up for you in the chat. Um, and we'll also give you a chance to unmute yourself. So thank you, Jesse, that was incredible. Um, and so humbling to, to hear your story. Um, so Ryan, I'll hand it over to you. Um, Ryan is an interventionist and pro program specialist at Light Upon Light, a space dedicated to combating polarization, hate, and extremism. And he was formerly a part of a neo-Nazi group in Michigan where he recruited others. Um, and today he's using martial arts and mentorship to help transform youth's lives who are on a path to violence. So Ryan, I'll hand it over to you and thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so Jesse's story is always so hard to follow up. But uh, I'll keep mine short and simple, and um, and really honestly, Jesse explained a lot of the things that we're we're kind of doing now, and and gave you those um, things to look at. But uh, so so I grew up, i um, similar to Jesse. I grew up in a my father's side of the family was a Catholic um, family. My mom's side was Baptist, very very liberal, um, easygoing. Uh, grandparents uh, still do mushrooms and uh, smoke cannabis to this day. Um, my dad's side, completely opposite, mostly alcoholics, very abusive. Um, and I'll get into that with my story. Um, you know, so, so growing up, I kind of had like these, they would almost say like two different, um, accents almost, or two different personalities. You know, I'd go to my mom's house where uh, she lived in the city of Flint. And, uh, for any of you that's not familiar with Flint, I'm sure you guys have heard about it through the water crisis. But mostly we're, we're made up off of GM jobs. General Motors employs most of the population or used to um, employ most of the population in the city of Flint. So um, everybody was connected through General Motors or knew something about each other through General Motors. Um, uh, being at my mom's house and in the city, she worked a third shift job trying to take care of three kids on her own. Uh, no support from anybody, she was single. And uh, while she was working third shift, uh, I would run the streets. Um, I found myself getting into a lot of trouble when I was young. Um, and then I would go to my dad's house and my mom wouldn't know what to do with me. So she'd throw me at my dad's house at times and, um, you know, asking for that extra support, like get this kid in, in, into shape, um, not realizing how abusive my father already was with me. Um, my dad beat me from a very, very young age. Um, he, you know, he hadn't really started in on full uh, punching me in the face. Um, I think the first time I can remember, I was about 14 years old when he threw my head through an actual wall. Um, and he would come home drunk. He was an iron worker. Um, he drank Jack Daniels. It was always his drink. You'd smell it on him. You just knew that you were in for it that night if he came home from the bar. Um, dealt with that for some years. Watched him beat my uh, stepmom at the time um, continuously um, to the point where me and her had formed a really good relationship with each other because we were both victims, you know, living under this house with this man. Um, uh, so, so dealt with abuse, but then at the same time, I'd go to my mom's house where everybody was loving, uh, beautiful family, accepted everybody. It didn't matter who my friends were, things like that. Um, but I did, I found myself getting into trouble. And um, eventually I was actually incarcerated. Um, I went to a boys school that's in just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania called Glen Mills Schools. Um, and I did about two and a half years there as a juvenile for a crime that I committed while I was back home. Um, graduated from out of the program. Um, I knew that I was going to be coming back to Flint and I would most likely fall back into those same friends again, that same system. And I didn't want to do that. So while I was there, 
Um, we had some military recruiters that came out and spoke to us quite a bit. And I said, you know what, I'm going to join the military like my grandfather's did. I uh, joined the Army right out of Glen Mills, came home for just a short time on leave before I actually went out to my uh, training and um, um, eventually did serve in Iraq, came home um, and uh, decided to leave the military, mostly because of mental issues that I was dealing with myself. Um, ETS, come back to Flint, and we're going through the housing crash. And General Motors is barely hiring anybody. Matter of fact, they were actually paying people, uh, buying them out of their contracts. And most of those guys were leaving the city. Restaurants were doing terrible because the service industry thrived off of General Motors workers. And it was really, really hard for a veteran, especially an infantry veteran, to find any type of work. It just wasn't there unless you went into construction or something like that. Um, I had an uncle that had just got out of prison. And to give you a little bit of context on my uncle, um, he was also somebody that had abused me. I was sexually molested at a very young age by my uncle and um, didn't realize that why I had kept such a close relationship with this man until later on when I started to go through my healing pro process and de-radicalization that victims will do this at times. And um, so my uncle got out of prison, the same uncle that had molested me. And he introduced me to some guys that he thought would be able to give me that brotherhood that I was missing that I had got from the military. He also knew that, um, you know, being abused my whole life, he grew up in the same family, so he was abused himself. And then going into the military, I never really had that chance to heal or realize that I had PTSD before I even went into the military. And then going in as an infantryman, everything we did was some type of violence. You know, if you weren't sitting around waiting, you were out doing some type of mount. And, um, and eventually, um, so he led me to these guys knowing that that violence was gonna be some form of addiction to me. It was gonna draw me towards this group. And um, he, he took me over to a house that um, was about what I guess you would say is your typical neo-Nazis house. You pull up, it was a house on the east side of Flint. Um, they had flags hanging outside that um, were, were mixed flags. So not all of them were something that was associated with Nazism. Some were Confederate, um, you know, the SS symbols, just different stuff that they had outside. They had a huge fire pit with a big American flag that was flying in their yard. And, you know, in my head, um, I got the fight or flight kind of thing going on as my uncle's taking me over here. And I'm thinking I'm about to walk into this garage and there's going to be all these guys that are like, shaved heads tatted up all over the place just huge you know prison guys that just got out of prison and actually to my surprise it wasn't it was um a lot of guys who had haircuts like me now you know yeah they had some tattoos and things but they weren't in there pushing each other around and starting some kind of like rowdy you know uh pit fight on some punk music or something it was guys that were probably mid 40s um to 50s and um were just having general conversation drinking beer uh, Ron Chadwell, who um, later was murdered, um, was the president of what was called the Buick City Boot Boys at the time. And Ron had a very um, charismatic way of talking to people. He was almost like a cult leader is how I try to explain it. He, he talked really soft. He would answer questions very quietly and um, always made sure to shake your hand and hold his other hand on your hand to, to let you know that like he cared and he loved about you and he loved you. And, um, and he knew what to look for. He was very good at knowing what was bothering you, what type of things you were missing, whether it was, you know, you needed money or you weren't eating properly or, you know, your family had abandoned you, whatever it was, he would find those things. He had a good way of trying to figure out what it was. And that's how he would recruit guys um, onto the scene. Um, I just came out of the military. Like I said, I was looking for that brotherhood. And um, it wasn't the ideology that drew me to it right away. It was that it was more of that brotherhood and things that I was missing. I was broke. Um, I didn't know what to do. I, I wasn't making any type of money. And easy money was the thing that drew to me at the time. And these guys were committing acts of you know, crimes to um, facilitate what they were doing um, in the Nazi movement. And um, so that drew me to it. And the violence, there was some violence um, that whether it was violence with each other, there was fights and, you know, the wrestling around and the craziness to going out and shooting weapons. Um, but either way, Ron knew with my military experience, they had just had a uh, double homicide 
um, two guys from the group were charged with murder. They had killed a man that had actually infiltrated the group and was trying to work for the police. Later found, said that he was Jewish. I don't know, you know if that's the true facts at the time, but they stabbed him. They took him down to the Flint River and they threw him in the river. Um, later, his body was found. They were able to you know, track the crimes back to these two guys, brothers that actually had committed it. And um, now they're serving life in prison. Ron knew that continuing to be the Buick City boot boys in Flint wasn't going to work out. That branding of what they had already made a name was, was negative and he wanted to do something else. This is around the time that MySpace was starting to get very popular. We hadn't even heard of Facebook yet. But social media was starting to pick up the ideas and you know the, the discussion about it. And what Ron wanted to really do was try to mainstream hate out of the state of Michigan. Um, we had several different groups that were in Michigan, but they were in small little pockets. And there was other groups that were around the country that he really wanted to try to link those guys all together. And he knew the only way he was going to be able to do that was bringing in young guys and young women that he knew could connect to social media sites. He knew that knew how what the internet was and how it worked. And, um, and that's what we did. Um, we rebranded the group as the Rolling Wood Skins, which was the neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, we started to go out and actively try to recruit people at a Crim Festival of Races, which is like a, there's a Boston Marathon in Flint. Um, we would go to several other community events, passing out flyers that had all kinds of different hate rhetoric on them. Uh, the 14 words of the white man, you know, that your um, culture is under attack and, uh, you know, you do something now, join us. And um, eventually we had the membership upwards to probably 150 to 200 people. They were in and out, not, you know, continuous members, but in and out. We, you know, kept a keg around. So there was constant for young people. Um, alcohol and substance abuse was the thing that, you know, Ron tried to keep around as much as possible because um, it kept those young people around that he needed. Um, eventually, uh, to keep the story a little shorter and tell you how I got to my de-radicalization, um, I was going out and stealing boat motors, brand new boat motors. We had a guy that had linked up with us that was buying them off of us for about half of what you would pay for a motor brand new. And then he was going out and almost selling them as brand new motors. He had sold them to, uh, he had made a mistake of selling a boat motor to one of the uh, rescue teams for a Grand Blanc fire department locally near us. And one of the places that we'd been stealing them for some time put a tracking device on one of the motors and they tracked it back to, um, my uncle's friend that had been committing some of these crimes with us. And, and later my house was raided. Um, didn't know at the time that gang task forces had already been keeping their eyes on us and watching us because of the Nazism and because of Ron's background and history in the city. And um, when they raided us, I had uh, police officers from the city of Flint, from local county offices, um, all had me in this room. It was the first time I'd ever been surrounded like that by um, you know, police officers uh, in a jail setting. Um, and it scared, it scared me. You know, I did not want to go back to being locked up like I was as a juvenile. Um, and I was willing to do whatever was necessary um, to keep that from happening. Um, unfortunately, when you commit a crime, you do the time. And um, I was sentenced um, to, to some jail time, to prison. And uh, while I was in, um, my cellmate at the time was a black man who, you know, honestly could have very easily been like, dude, this guy's in the newspapers. We know that he was part of a skinhead group. You know, let's jump him. Let's take care of him right here on the spot. But he didn't do that. He actually was understanding of me and, and asked me a lot of questions about where I came from. You know, how did I, how did I become the person that I am today? And um, he, you know, he told me, that's not you. Like that wasn't you, you had black friends growing up as a kid. Like you weren't, you weren't that guy, you know? So, so why, why, you know, what, what drew you there? And he was really understanding. And um, there, there came a time where I did get jumped while I was in prison. And um, there were skinheads that were in there with us. There were other white supremacists that were in there with us that used to sit at the table that could have easily came over and helped me out while I was being jumped, but they didn't. The one guy that did was a black man that to this day, I still wish I could find where he's at. I've looked on social media, I've looked all over for him and, and never been able to just to thank him again. Um, but he saved my life that day. He pulled me into the cell and uh, shut the door behind him, fought off men until the deputies were able to get there and stop it all. And I was moved into a medical facility um, to heal for my wounds because I got beat pretty bad. 
And um, I started my de-radicalization process um, and my healing process. I, I would say that was probably the turn for me of events. Um, when I was released, um, I started to reach out to local um, organizations. I had a probation officer at the time that was very, very open to some of the um, organizations that helped to bring people out of hate groups, um, help to introduce them to um, Jewish communities that were doing a lot of this um, de-radicalization type process that Jesse does with his organization. And um, I was actually able to sit down with Holocaust victims. Um, they showed me you know, their tattoo, their numbers, and had me show them my tattoo. And it was a very emotional moment for me. And they were still open and loving to me though. And that was surprising to me because I'd always been told that you know, you hear all this anti, you know, this Zionist, they're here to take over the world and they're here to destroy you. And, and um, that openness and understanding that I got from them um, really changed my heart. And um, it, this was years, you know, this wasn't something that happened overnight. My de-radicalization didn't happen, you know, and it, just because of that fight, um, I started to see a psychologist. I started to see a psychiatrist. Um, I had a medical professional that was a friend of mine that actually said, you know, Ryan, I think you suffer from a lot of trauma that you've never really been able to, to heal from and speak to somebody about. And so it was through a lot of that, that my psychologist and my psychiatrist were really able to point out that I was holding on to a lot of this hatred for, for, you know, against my father and the hatred against the military and our country and a lot of self-hatred for myself that I didn't love who I was. I wasn't willing to love myself. And after I was willing to subconsciously deal with those things that had been affecting me, realized that I have a purpose no matter what. We can be you know, godly or we can be evil. And I realized that, that I had a calling to speak to people. Um, I had somebody that actually came from a hate group themselves and wanted to change. They heard the changes that I had been going through and wanted help. And so that was the first person I was able to actually pull from a group and realized that, man, I really do have a purpose here. And I did that for some years by myself, working with a couple of different organizations um, that would give me assistance. Um, and eventually said, you know, what is going on in my city here that draws people to gangs? Because it wasn't just skinheads. You had Crips, you had the Bloods, you had Vice Lords, you had it all, Spanish Cobras when I was a kid. And so many people my age were drawn to those things. You know, why? why what, you know, what is going on? Well, it was a lack of mentorship. It was a lack of community programs that gave them an outlet to go do, um, whether it was boxing or you know, sports, whatever it might be. We didn't have a lot of that here. And um, there wasn't a mentorship anywhere, except for maybe the Boys to Girls Club. And it was nothing like um, it is in Detroit and Flint. So I, um, I decided I got with some friends of mine that I had met through college. Um, a friend of mine, Pat Williams, was a, was a counselor and went through um, his social work program at University of Michigan, which is one of the largest liberal arts programs in the country. And we were both into martial arts. We did jujitsu together. And we said, why don't we start a mixed martial arts program that we can hit kids at an early age before they even get radicalized, before they even you know, get introduced to the gangs and, and try to pull these kids from their programs. And I love that idea because I went as a juvenile to Glen Mills, you know, and, and I, a lot of that affected me. And there was a lot of trauma there from that too, being away from my family, um, getting into fights and things like that to protect myself there at the school. And, um, and so if I could keep a kid from going back to the same process that I did in life, then that, that was what I was going to do. And so we started a mixed martial arts program called Team Revelation Mixed Martial Arts. It was a Christian program. We actually worked out of a church called The Bridge. Um, which uh, gave us a 6,000 square foot space for free. Didn't charge us a dime, nothing. Let us bring a full size cage inside, wrestling mats, um, mitt, everything you could think of that would go into a mixed martial arts gym. They allowed us to bring in here. A lot of stuff was donated from the community. Um, and what I thought was going to be a small program, you know, maybe a couple kids here and there, um, end up uh, growing really, really fast. And we eventually helped about 300 kids. Um, not all of them were on probation. So I'd say right around 100 kids that I came through that were on probation. Um, eventually had probation officers wanting to take a tour because they were like, dude, these kids are coming to us and they have changed their lives from what we thought they were going to be in prison. And here they are. They're, they're really like positive about what they're, what they're doing in life. You know, their grades have went up. Like, what are you guys doing? And we showed them. And we, just so you know, we weren't just doing mixed martial arts. We do 
um, tutoring if you needed help with that, if you were having reading. Literacy rates were really, really low in the city of Flint, still are. And so we worked with reading programs. We had a smoothie and uh, shake system thing. You could come in and get smoothies and shakes if you wanted to. And we stayed open for a really, really long time. Eventually, um, funding did fall through. Um, it was very, very hard to try to get grants for any type of program like this. And um, unfortunately, the, um, the program kind of fell through. Uh, me and Pat tried to keep things going. We would visit other churches. And that's kind of what I do today at times. Um, but it just wasn't a program that we could continuously put on and have the staff that we needed to 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 do stuff with it. Um, I was upset with that. You know, I almost fell flat, you know, face first and went right back into you know radicalization. I'm like, what am I doing here? I got to wake up here and realize that everything happens for a reason. You know, what is God trying to lead me towards? And um, I started to look into politics locally. I ran for county commissioner here locally. Um, trying to find out, you know, we'd had the same politicians that have sat on these boards for, you know, 17 to 20 years, sometimes longer. And I'm like, why aren't they facilitating, you know, programs and, and, and funding programs in the city of Flint? Why is everything going to the outskirts, to the, to the outer suburbs? And, um, and realize a lot of these politicians that live outside of the city that didn't want the funding going to Flint, to the urban communities. And, um, and I, said to myself, I'm going to do something about this. So I started working with uh, organizations, uh, Michigan United here in the state of Michigan, um, and then People's Action, which was a national network, um, where we uh, went to protests, peaceful protests. Um, we um, spoke at, you know, several different um, community programs about what can we do to, you know, help our community out to, to build partnerships, to have the funding for these types of programs. And, um, and, and I was really successful in doing a lot of that. Um, eventually, I was in the news a lot because of the stuff that I had been doing and because of my past. And um, I got a call one day. Um, I had been feeling like, man, I'm, I'm pulling some of these guys from out of these groups, but I don't have that constant support to like really help keep an eye on these guys or help to kind of keep them in that de-radicalization process that I had went through. And um, I got a call and, you know, right when I thought everything was going to fall through again. Um, I get a call from Uncall, which is um, one of the people that works for Jesse Morton, and um, said, hey, the CEO of our organization would like to speak with you. You know, can he give you a call this week? And I'm like, sure. You know, and I'm looking Jesse up and I'm like, wow, this organization is amazing. And um, I talked to Jesse and I, we were instantly brothers, man. I mean, everything we had talked about, we had been through and to see that there were so many other people that had been through the same type of trauma and the way that they were facing these things um, and the intervention work that they had been doing um, was an eye opener for me. And I realized that this was God's calling for me. I had already learned how to do narrative storytelling. I traveled the country talking to different people about my story. And Jesse gave this outlet for people like us to help others. And so that people could see our stories and understand us and really reach out to people from a pro-human approach. Um, there was times where I would get into doing some of the stuff with the left um, that I would feel like, man, I, I feel like I'm, it's dividing people more at times. Um, you know, you go at people and you say anti this or anti that, and immediately they turn their back to you because they're like, they're already against us, you know, and I realized that that wasn't working. It was creating static and friction. But with Jesse and the way that their group would really reach out to people was through this like pro-human approach of like understanding, love, empathy. I, I try to tell people this all the time that you can be empathetic to somebody, but you don't have to be sympathetic to them. There's a difference there. And just being empathetic and understanding that we are all human beings. We all make mistakes at some point in time. Um, it does not mean that it's the end of us, that that person is completely ruined because there is that godliness inside of us. Um, I, I say this, you know, as a Christian, you know, what would Jesus do? You know, he didn't go out and preach to churches. He wasn't in uh, you know, giving sermons to people that were already Christians. He was going out and speaking to prostitutes. He was speaking to thieves. He was talking to people um, that he knew needed the help. And um, that was really where I realized this, this is my calling. This was my way to, to speak to people is to have that understanding and that openness in my heart and realize that a lot of these guys were part of these hate groups, whether it's, you know, far right extremism, whether it's jihadism, whatever it might be, that those people were humans, just like they're humans, just like me. And that they've probably been down the same road that I have or some similar road. 
And we need to focus on that trauma and see if there's a way that we can pull them out of there. And it's been very successful. Um, there's other work that we do too that Jesse and me can talk about. Um, but to this day, that's the, the work that we do. I know that we're getting ready to go out to the Pacific Northwest. Well, we'll be out in the Portland area. I don't know how much I can go into that. Jesse can, he can talk more about it. But um, you know, our work has taken us around the country to different places. Um, and, and here we are today, you know, discussing it all with you guys. So thank you for in inviting me. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. It's incredible to hear your story. And I'm just in awe of the ways that, you know, you're helping others, youths to get out of radicalization and also caring holistically for your community, not just trying to you know, combat this one thing, but saying like, we also need these needs to be met and we need to address structural inequalities and um, things that are, are keeping people um, in places of marginalization or oppression. So um, yeah, it's thank you so much. I'm just so grateful to hear um, your story and for both of you being willing to share that. Um, and I do want to open it up for questions. I'm sure people do have questions. And I know um, Ryan and Jesse also, um, you have a lot to say about the current state of polarization in our country today, and also just issues um, that are currently affecting our communities like Islamophobia. Um, you know, for you, Ryan, where, where you're living, um, and then also Jesse as a practicing Muslim. Um, so if you would like to, to speak to that, and then also want to encourage everyone to type any questions you may have in the chat so that they can answer those as well. I guess we can wait on the questions first and see if anybody has any questions. Up to you, Jesse, unless you want, you know, you want to speak on that or? Our train is delayed till 825. So I'm here still in the train station, but um, yeah, here if needed. <laughs> well, I actually do have one question. Um, I, you both have touched on this idea of trauma-informed approaches. And I've heard you say, Jesse, on another podcast that the kind of commenting on the role of adverse childhood experiences in leading people towards radicalization. And I know, Ryan, you were saying that it wasn't the ideology that originally drew you to that group. It was the, the community and the relationship. Um, could you just speak on that a little bit more? Kind of, um, yeah. So I'll start with some of the um, evidence uh, that backs the programming and then Ryan can build off of that. The realm of adverse childhood experience is, is a fascinating one in general, right? So there's a major movement uh, in our society right now to identify ways that we might go about addressing the issues that are facing us. And they're going to be exacerbated due to the isolation and the mental health complications that come along with two years of quarantine and lack of human touch. Um, at the level of uh, research on adverse childhood experiences, a major study conducted with Kaiser Permanente um, uh, insurance uh, recipients uh, that identified really large prevalencies of things like child abuse, things like um, sexual abuse amongst children. And it developed a scale that has now correlated the quantity of adverse childhood experiences, if there's four or more in particular, that people report, um, they are linked to higher rates of uh, incarceration, higher rates of mental health, actually linked to a lack, uh, lesser life expectancy, uh, sexual violence, domestic violence, um, recidivism for those that have been incarcerated that have more uh, adverse childhood experiences than others, recidivism rates are higher. There's a range of negative social outcomes that are affiliated with early childhood development to carry on through life. And it started a fundamental transformation in the way that we perceive the role that trauma plays and connecting early experience into adult behavior. Um, this has touched uh, a lot of different fields, but when we came along, had not touched the realm of radicalization studies nor intervention and prevention programming so we um have started to hypothesize and inquire as to whether or not the same relationships might exist between susceptibility for radicalization and the quantification of adverse childhood experiences and over four years we've done if you count domestic english language speaking 
people that are engaged in extremist movements, we've done a little over 300 cases. 270 of those we've been able to give the ACE test to, and we've been able to identify that 86% of the people that we work with had four or more adverse childhood experiences before they radicalized to support a violent extremist movement. This would place that as higher than the level of prevalency in juvenile delinquents. Um, and it really is representative of a missing key ingredient for how we might go about preventing people from being radicalized in, 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 in the first place. So pulling from that in the realm of trauma-informed care, we now have understanding of the importance of things like attachment, attachment to your parents and how that can manifest as avoidant, right? Or anxious anxiety that involves around relationships. We know about how to heal it with social connectedness. We now understand the importance of connecting body and mind and using tools like meditation and mindfulness um, in order, non-pharmacological alternatives in the mental health field. The APA, the American Psychological Association in the United States, refuses to include complex trauma based on adverse childhood experience scores as a diagnosis because rather we would be able to charge as mental health practitioners to implement things like mindfulness training, evidence-based practices that work better than um, uh, depressants, better than pharmacological approaches. And in the realm of radicalization, it applies because if the ideology is only a component of a culture, and if it's more about group and it's more about getting community, and as a consequence of adverse childhood experiences, you're not connecting to your society because you don't have good personal interactions. So you're the kid that's not recognized in the classroom. Then what that creates is it creates an ability where we're not recognizing it, how we can build a trauma conscious society that can mitigate and limit some of the trauma that we're experiencing. And that has implications for early intervention for susceptibility for radicalization. Also being engaged in a violent extremist movement is clearly traumatizing. And so if we can take best practices that are being utilized that don't require a lot of money, that don't require a psychiatrist to write a prescription, and that can be basically administered in conjunction with best practices in trauma-informed care, one of which is cultural competency and cultural sensitivity, like really keen attention to gender and historical dynamics. But what we've basically done is we'll take a practice like mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a eight-week course administered in three-hour sessions, uh, evaluated uh, across a range of risk factor related for, it's even been used to combat toxic polarization effectively. And we'll translate those practices into a manner where an Islamist, some woman who has joined the Islamic State and has now come home to the United States or Canada, will translate them around principles in Islam like a taqwa, which is basically to stay in the moment, dhikr, which is meditation, right? So we would translate these principles in a culturally sensitive manner or in evangelicalism, We'll talk about the distinction between Jesus and his arguments with the rabbis of his era and the way that he was essentially addressing through empathy, the same approach that trauma informed care addresses with regard to the importance of feeling connected to your community. So framing our interventions in that way makes it palatable for the target population that we try to reach, but it also takes an evidence based practice that has already been evaluated and we can tweak it and then we can evaluate and get the science that we need to justify how we might apply trauma-informed, trauma and countering violent extremism-informed approaches at every level of the public health spectrum. So from early prevention and education and awareness of bystanders at early primary levels of public health to the intervention space with our trauma and countering violent extremism-informed paradigm, we have a 10-session workbook we build for inmates that are convicted with terrorism-related offenses. That allows us to establish rapport, but also incorporate a better understanding of that space between stimulus and response. Um, we neutralize the term radicalization because we think radicalization doesn't have to be negative. You can radicalize pro-socially. You can radicalize in a non-violent manner. Jesus was a radical. Muhammad was a radical. Uh, they all challenged the status quo of their societies. We should encourage that, not try to prevent that, but we should encourage the commitment to non-violence. Recognition that a lot of the grievances of extremists are real. We have a willingness to talk about foreign policy rather than to just say, oh, it has nothing to do with foreign policy when it comes to jihadists. And we have a willingness to talk with far right-wing extremists about the fact that Yes, it is true. It's very hard to tell working class white people these days that they have privilege um, due to socioeconomic inequality and due to experiences. It's very easy for liberals that are affluent to uh, think that the, um, the privilege and the racism is on uh, the side of the working class Trump supporter. But in fact, gentrification and mobilization and movement from 
um, liberal peoples into metropolitan areas in New York City, Washington, D.C. throughout the 90s and the early 2000s is primarily responsible for a reverse migration of African-Americans driving up rent so that they migrated down south where all the prisons exist and the military industrial complex grew in its most proportion. So being able to say that, being able to recognize that and being able to recognize the trauma that's associated with all of those processes is very important if we're really going to get our way out of it. And that's where you get the principle that you can't attack a, a problem at the same order of consciousness that creates it, because through what we're learning about trauma and how much it influences all of our lives, we believe that that alongside of the hard sciences, understanding neuroscience, understanding what education should really look like versus what it looks like now, um, uh, is, it is the only way that we'll be able to get ourselves out of this trap um, and watching the social fabric tear apart. So we believe also that trauma informed care is not just an approach we take to combating radicalization and violent extremism, but it is actually the only mechanism for creating an alternative parallel network upon which a paradigm shift in the social construction of our society can formulate. And so that we can push forth an, a, a, an, an effort to sort of like, we're kind of calling in the wilderness in, in a sense. And we're saying like, um, in our estimation, um, if we replicate the same mistakes we made with the jihadists and we paint a black and a white worldview as we shift to a domestic war and extremism after January 6th last year, we're going to blow up the system. And the only thing that's waiting in the wake is not bin Laden's caliphate, but it is Chinese, Russian, Iranian authoritarianism um, with uh, an ability to completely alter uh, the global macro landscape. Um, and we do believe that we are in the very final stages of that. We're one recession, one economic catastrophe away from waking up and realizing that we're in a very bad state and might, might not be able to get ourselves out of it. So we're trying to, um, in a sense, be able to tap into the same idealistic, utopic visions that radicals and violent extremists sell their communities by mobilizing and letting the people that we affect know that we need you to join our movement, that we need us to all disseminate these learnings, that we need to make sure that we are reducing the number of adverse childhood experiences early in life by creating educational systems, by creating awareness amongst the bystanders for child abuse, for sexual abuse, and by creating conditions upon which we can get ourselves out of the tribalist trap, if you will. And um, I'll stop there and pass it over to Ryan. Jesse, somebody had asked, and I know this is something that um, I know that I always love hearing, but that you had mentioned that we have to um, reach things from a different level of consciousness than what they had originated from. And they want to know if you can kind of elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, on the principle of you have to attack a, a problem, you can't attack a problem. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so consciousness is basically the worldview that we hold. Um, and um, one thing about consciousness that we are learning is the benefit of being, let's say, in a trauma-informed space, mindful. So mindfulness is to be present in the moment and to be aware of what is going on around you. And in order to do that effectively, we have to be aware of the way that the human brain is hardwired to uh, adopt uh, erroneous biases. So cognitive biases plague a lot of our thinking. And we know all kinds of things about this. So school of thought, for example, Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky developed this school of heuristics and biases, which highlighted the irrationality of the decisions that we make. I'm gonna have to pause. Is that, is that toward Miami? One second. This is real, you know, this is, this doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> yeah, so life. anyway, I'm very sorry. So, um, so yeah, so basically this school, this school of thought comes along and it, it, it's not really necessarily applied to economics. At the time, economics is driven by this rational actor theory where we assume that homo economicus exists where man is maximizing gains and minimizing losses and that all of our calculations are based upon the pursuit of pleasures that can be quantified outside of ourselves it rules out sacred values but like if i'm going to sell a cup or if i'm going to price the value of a cup a mug if it's not mine and i don't own it and i have no affiliation for it i'm going to say it's worth two dollars but if i drink coffee out of it every day even though that decreases its values i'm not getting rid of it for more than 20 bucks so that shows that all of the underlying assumptions of economics are faulty that there's something about us that has attachment to things that we engage with right and it uprooted economics to the point where kahneman won a nobel peace prize and now we have a school of thought called behavioral economics that looks at the irrationality and looks at the faulty underpinning assumptions of the way that economics worked and has been able to be utilized to challenge um, economics and economic theory in a way where capitalism itself is called into question. 
And so by saying that and suggesting that that happened in the realm of economics, but has not yet happened in the realm of society, we could do the same thing about the faulty assumptions of education. Education, we're supposed to memorize facts and we're supposed to get good at science and we're supposed to get good at math. And then we're supposed to succeed in life, right? Unfortunately, the substance of that education is crucial to our formulating the consciousness that allows us to be empathetic human beings. So if the educational systems are teaching us based upon economic theory that tells us to be self-seeking, that everybody's out there seeking themselves, and if as a consequence, the art and the culture of our society espouses the same view, you know, survivor, we're all in competition to get everybody else off the island, we're supposed to manipulate, play games, you know, this is what our media tells us we're supposed to behave in, but it's not the way that we, uh, as a society, can establish a conscious state of affairs. Right. So what we say elevating above to the next order of consciousness is looking at what the science is showing us about trauma, looking at what we're learning about decision making under conditions of uncertainty, looking at the ability to paint in the important role of ideology and culture and the arts and how it affects the human being and challenge the notion that we are self-seeking evolved monkeys without a preferential attachment to sacred values and then to create sacred values that we can believe in and unite upon. Um, we really think that that's really the only avenue to getting ourselves out of this rut because empires have all fallen like this. Breads and circuses economies with minimal substance to the art precedes the downfall of almost every single empire, along with overseas outreach in order to try to wage wars abroad in defense of security at home that only induces lack of security at home. We're repeating all of those same similar mistakes and only an elevation in consciousness, a change in the way that we think about ourselves and our relation to the world and the people that are in our community, uh, we just don't think there's any other way out. Uh, we don't think talking to the other side at this point is valuable. Um, we think that it only cements and entrenches views. That's what the psychology shows. You could be willing to talk to the other side, but in so doing only further entrench your own commitments, your own beliefs. We're all living in echo chambers where we only hear the views of the side of the political and the cultural argument that we agree with. We're um, only hearing about the other side from the people with, uh, within our own echo chambers, which is only cementing an exasperation of the tribalism. And so it's, it's really like getting enough people to get outside of that box. And there's many other organizations and many other institutions that are willing to do this. But I think we all have to take that on as a role. And that's why our paradigm is called control, alt, delete, hate. Control the space between stimulus and response. Find empowerment there. Alter course. Make some recognitions to overcome the cognitive biases that are faulty inside of our own selves and impart that awareness to others. Make a commitment to nonviolence and also a commitment that this is not destined to go on forever. We do have a role to play. And that's where you get to delete hate, where we all have a role to play to delete hate in ourselves and in our communities around us and hopefully manifest something akin to a movement that can achieve that. And in that sense, it might not be realizable, but it is the right thing to do. And I don't have to sell a utopic vision to an extremist who says, but I get so much exhilaration from all of the excitement and all of the massive efforts I'm taking to destroy the world, right? Without a vision to build it up. So when you say to a jihadist, it's great, but you don't have a vision that works to build it up to the far right. Oh, your ethno state, isn't there's no coherent vision you have a problem with the far left you have a problem with capitalism what does your alternative look like they're not worried about the alternative they're worried about tearing down what exists right coherent articulation of the solution is not something that extremists do well so we can articulate a coherent set of principles upon which the future might look like but it all revolves around not changing the system outside of ourselves it involves changing ourselves and the way that we engage with each other and in that sense it's not so much about who the extremists are it might just be about who we are that might be the issue so i don't know if that explains it or not but you know, I just touch on a little bit of what was said here too in the, the chat. I mean, Jesse kind of said something earlier about the um, the way that we, you know, went after jihadism, the way we went after terrorism um, after 9-11. And, and the way that I think America for, for a long time has, you know, like you said, put military bases all around the world and how imperialism has worked to, um, you know, war and resources and destruction. And, and I think that, um, it's 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 a tragedy. I think if a lot of that money that we spend on defense um, went into more social programs or mentorship programs or mental health or healthcare for that matter in our country, um, we would see a major change, especially focusing on mental health, because I feel like 
um, in so many spaces, um, like you see here recently in Michigan, and we've dealt with this in other states too around the country uh, with the, the recent school shootings and the mass shootings that we're seeing. And a lot of this goes down to um, what Jesse was talking about, about a failed education system. And I actually recently had wrote a paper on this that Jesse and we're going to eventually publish um, about how we basically set these scales, these standardized testing for kids and saying that, you know, all kids need to hit these standards. Well, that's not a reality. You know, every kid is treated somewhat differently in life. You know, one kid might not be eating breakfast in the morning. He might not be eating at home at all. And the only meals that he's getting is the ones that he's at school. Um, whereas these other kids are treated, you know, in a completely different manner. Um, and they're able to study more because the other kids got to worry about more life type things when they come home. He has to worry about survival. And so to keep it short there, like they go into school and they go to do this testing and we're already natural without even realizing it because half the people that set these standardized testings up don't actually have to live like we do. And they start to create class divides and people start to fall behind and they become what they feel like is an outsider. And in today's world, you get kids that will go back home, they get on the internet and they create this, their own perception in their own world. And they will start to feed what that is. And that, that's their entrance to, to extremism. Uh, most extremist organizations on the right, um, on the left, it doesn't matter how extreme it might get, they basically focus in on those things that that kid is missing. So if they felt like they were an outcast in school, they don't fit in at school because they didn't get as good enough grades as other kids or they're bullied, whatever it might be. These organizations know how to keen in on what that person is going through. Like I had said with me, financially, I was hurting. I was looking for that brotherhood. For kids that are looking on the internet at these extremist organizations and they're like, oh, wow, the Proud Boys look like something I could get into. It's because they realize that on their own, they don't feel like they could really stand up to the world and, and, and be somebody that they want to be or that the world has told them that they need to be. But if they're with an organization like, and I just say Proud Boys just as an example, um, if they join these organizations, they can. Or we have what we call in what is what's the most dangerous extremist and terrorist that we're dealing with today is what a lone wolf terrorist is. And that um, can be, you know, these mass shooters, these kids. We don't know who they are because we don't have enough mental health systems set up within the school system. We don't have enough support at home. And these kids fall through the cracks. And we don't know who they are because schools aren't educating and teaching staff members on what are red flags and things that we need to be looking for. They're not giving those kids that are falling behind a different program. We, we still grade things A plus, B plus, what the shops and the corporations told us we need to do because that was what an A plus and B plus product was. That, that all has to change. And if we don't change the system as a whole, like Jesse said, you know, republics and, and empires like this have fallen time and time again. And it all comes back to a lot of these things that we're dealing with. These organizations, these people, they will, will go off of what the U.S. is failing. In. Um, one of my things that I've done for my research was environmental impacts. Because of Flint, coming from Flint and the water crisis that happened here, I actually started to see where militias were coming in and recruiting kids and adults and saying, hey, we'll give you guys water. We're passing out water in the community. We're good people. We're good people. In all actuality, these were some skinhead groups. These were Aryan Brotherhood groups. And people were drawn to this, this brotherhood and this love that they were showing to the community by giving them water. When all actuality, they were just basically trying to take advantage of, of a problem that you know wasn't being addressed by the government itself at home. Um, you can see the same thing when you go to the Middle East with the Taliban and with Al Qaeda and these different groups that um, will come into a, a village and people need those same type of things and they will give them to them, but you have to follow what we do. You have to join our groups. And um, I realized that too, I, I went to Standing Rock. Um, I went with the big veterans push that went out. I wanted to, to use that as part of my research and to see what was going on because I work with a lot of the indigenous groups that are here in the state of Michigan. I have a lot of friends and family and different people that are part of the indigenous groups here. And they had always preached peace. And you know you were seeing media showing one thing and then you were seeing something else on social media. And so I, I wanted to see for myself. And what I saw there through my research was that you had a, a big group that was there that really wanted to do peace. Matter of fact, they were going down and doing some of the stuff like they did in Tibet where 
they would bring mirrors and they would show it to the police officers. They would hold the mirrors and they would say, look at yourselves, look what you're doing to us. All in peace, you know, we're not here to create violence, but look how violent you're being towards us when we're just standing here in prayer. And um, there was a whole other group that was kind of branched off from all of them that wanted to create chaos, wanted to create panic and destruction. And, um, and they were facilitating to those type of things too. Oil companies will never um, care about any of us we must destroy them instead of like trying to figure out what we can do to maybe go around that, like green energy or something else. It was, no, we need to destroy them. We need to destroy what's going on here. And that creates eco-terrorism, you know? And so it can go on one side or the other and people get hurt from any of it. Violence never pays off. Martin Luther King said it um, best. You cannot combat violence with violence. You know, it has to be um, from love. It has to come from the heart and it has to be something that's real and humane. So, um, I don't know, there's any more questions? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to, that's really good. Thank you so much, Jess, or Ryan, sorry. Um, I wanted to invite people to also, just feel free to unmute yourselves um, at this point to ask a question so you can have a little more conversation um, and dialogue. So, and thank you, Jesse. I know you're boarding your train. <laughs> Feel free to open ask me any questions i mean if you want to get personal i'm, I'm my story is an open book um my wife knows you know she she believes in my story and that it, it's helped to change other people and so um that's why I, you know i bring up the abuse that did happen to me because i think it's all part of what people need to understand that Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I just, since you mentioned your wife, it made me think about what it looks like for you to share your history and experience as you meet new people. Obviously, it's really powerful to share with a group in this sort of setting, but what does that look like um, as you're building interpersonal relationships that you kind of share your context or history in that way? Well, I got really lucky with my wife. And that she came from a very, very open family that um, um, doesn't judge you for the past mistakes that you have made. Um, they love everybody and they're willing to love everybody and, and, and they come to that level of understanding. Um, was it difficult for me in some relationships? Yes, it was. Um, I was in the newspaper a lot while I was doing bad things and I was in the newspaper a lot for doing good things. And, um, you know, I think a lot of it goes through action is showing people that I have made the change and I continue to keep doing the right things. Um, you know, a lot of people can get up here and talk all day long and say that they've made the change and they've done that. Um, but really when it comes down to it, you know, just like where we hold our politicians accountable, they could say all they want on the campaign trail, but are they actually doing it in real life on an everyday basis? And that's something that I've held myself to. I don't make a bunch of money doing this. I don't really make any money at times doing any of this because that's not what it's about to me. Um, what it's about is making that change and seeing somebody's face um, when they finally have pulled themselves from that group or when they've had that like connection, a spiritual connection to whether it's God or just whatever their higher power may be and saying, wow, like I found my purpose. And um, it's by continuing to do that action, continuing to work in my community, it's built better relationships. But, but it was hard in the beginning. Um, I didn't come out to the public and talk to people after. And, and I think it was better for my de-radicalization. It was better for my psychology, my self-help um, to do those kind of things. Um, but my wife, we've been married almost 10 years now. Um, I've been de-radicalized for almost 20 years, um, but she's been very, very supportive of me. Um, she pushed me to do things that I didn't think that I could do. Um, and my kids and her are my driving force every single day, but I don't, you know, it's not as easy for everybody. There are people that don't have a supportive family. Um, there are people that don't have, you know, a wife or a loving family that are there to help push them in that direction. And so that's why it's so important, I think, for organizations like Jesse's and what I've done, the work that I do around the country and uh, Daryl Davis and so many other people that we work with. Um, it's important to have those people around because they're willing to be empathetic and understanding to somebody's story. And it doesn't matter what you came from. I'm willing to sit down at the table with you and listen to you. Like I said, you don't have to necessarily be sympathetic with them to be empathetic with them. And I think that's important right now in society is that we're teaching and empath we, we're so, there's no empathy there. I mean, there's so much of it you see on social media when you're going through that's creating some type of anxiety and stress and hate and 
and everything feeds into that. These algorithms feed into all that. And I think if we started to have more positive news stories, if we started to share, you know, stories of change and empathy and what we can do and how we're all humans, we're not robots, you know, and I think that's important. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> thanks so much for sharing. Um, you, you talked a little bit about using mixed martial arts as part of your program. And, and there's got to be at least a few of us um, that might look at martial arts, mixed martial arts, as being rather violent right. um, when we're looking for peaceful solutions. I was wondering if you could maybe shine a light a little bit on that and how yeah. that actually is useful. So um, when we did our mixed martial arts program, we didn't focus on the violence of going out and committing, you know, a, a cage fight or doing something like that. We tried to really um, go around like what the Kung Fu type approach is to things. And really you only use these types of things for self-defense if you absolutely had to. It was more about inner peace and that serenity that it can give you and meditation. And, um, and it was through, through drills like that where we would sit down, we would actually meditate before we'd get into any class. There was meditation. Um, if you were a Christian, um, we had Christian prayer that you could go over to. If you were you know, Muslim and you wanted to do your own prayer, it didn't matter. Um, whatever it was, we would have, we would tell everybody, hey, we're going to say a prayer for everybody today. If you want to be part of it, you can, or you can step away. It's up to you. And, um, and we would just have these moments of meditation. And I think it was through a lot of that and, and showing them that, you know, this types of things, martial arts weren't created. Um, to go out and commit violent acts. You know, they were created to really find that inner peace and that self-discipline. And so that's kind of what we try to focus on more instead of the, uh, the violent side of it, or like, let's go to cage fights and let's all get out and knuckle up. Like, that wasn't what it was about to any of us at all. And still to this day, when I do my martial arts, um, it's all about just the meditation, the relaxation that I get from it. That's a good question. My wife just said it's like yoga for men. <laughs> it, it really, it really is. A lot of, and there's a lot of women too. Surprisingly, we were surprised to see how many women had been struggling in life too, and, and young girls that had, you know, either been abused or had, you know, there, a lot of girls. When I was part of the the skinhead, the Nazi movement, there's a lot of girls that were there with us too every single day, and um, you know, we've pulled some women from these groups too. So it's it goes both ways, and I think just humans overall, you know, need that, that meditation. We need that time to just, you know, breathe and let go of some of those things that we're holding on to subconsciously and, and to face them, you know? And um, I think through support of groups like that and doing those kind of things and not just martial arts, there's so many other things. Yoga is amazing for everybody. If you're a man, do some yoga too. It doesn't, you don't have to be a woman to do yoga. That's for sure. <laughs> um, Jeff, um, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, but if anybody has any more questions, I have a question for you, Ryan, which is um, for us as like everyday ordinary peacemakers in our circles and our communities, what kind of advice would you give to us in the realm of how can we help to foster peace during these times of... So, like I said, I, you know, I come to people, I mean, you had kind of a conversation about this a little bit, was... Um, and really just that understanding and the empathy. And as a Christian, um, I believe Christianity really led me to like my inner godliness. So I feel like I'm not God, but that inner goodness that we all hold on to that we all have in us. And um, I had a pastor one time, Jeff Sheed, that had gave a, a sermon that was so amazing to me. And so many people listened in on it and shared it because he said that he, you know, he was brought to God through Christianity but so many other people that he thinks that God is so creative in so many different ways that, you know, he couldn't have sent Christ to indigenous America at the time and said, you know, preach Christ and, and God and that they were going to listen to him. Most likely he would have been killed and wouldn't have worked out. And so God had to have creative ways of leading people to goodness. And I think that's where you hear about it in like the Quran and different things that we have these prophets of peace and prophets for God that are there to preach good and peace and that empathy and the understanding that we're all human beings, that we're not God, we're nobody's perfect in this world. And so when I go out into the world, that, that old saying of what would Jesus do? And I try to hold myself up to that every, every day. You know, I, I want to be that fire on the mountain for other people. 
and lead them to that because I've been in those dark, dark valleys. And I think one of the biggest things is, and I preach this all the time, is coming at somebody on a more pro-human approach. Don't be anti-everything. Be pro-human and what can we do to, to overcome these obstacles together and having that empathy so that we can and that understanding so that we can. Um, sometimes all somebody needs is a hug. I mean, literally that hug might change that person's life forever. And um, so that's what, that's what I live by every day. And if you could do that and teach that in your homes, I'm not telling you how to be parents or, or you know, how to teach your school children or whatever it might be. But I think if we started to put more of that love and empathy and understanding, um, hey, you start to see some real changes. I've seen it happen. So I know that it works. Jesse's seen it happen. And, um, you know, countless other people that have changed their lives that had backgrounds like ours. And so it's important to remember that, that we're all humans. We all make a mistake and at some point in time in your life. Um, it's not about that mistake that you made, but it's about how you picked yourself back up and how you continue to keep um, doing the right thing. And I had a person tell me one time, and I'll finish with this, that as long as I continue to walk the path of righteousness, and this was an indigenous man when I was at Standing Rock at the um, sacred fire that we were at. And he said, Ryan, you know, as long as you continue to walk the path of righteousness, no one will be able to ever knock you off of that as long as you're walking that path of righteousness. So that's what I've continued to keep doing. Um, and that's what I will always do. And uh, to the day, you know, I, I see my next life. So I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you to Jesse for everything that you've shared with us. And, um, you know, we have a lot to learn from <laughs> your stories and your lives and the work that you're doing. Um, and we're so grateful to you for giving your time with us this evening. Yeah, definitely. Thank I appreciate you. all of you. Thank you. Love you guys. <laughs>